Okay. So it started, and thank you very much. Guys. I have to go. Where is my water bottle? We are the I need to have a We are the S prop and check right. Can you please close the door? Okay, I'd like to welcome you in the octo final round of the Winter Holidays Open 2017 debate tournament. I welcome We RDS on the proposition and Check Red on the opposition. Uh, this round of the finals will be judged by Teen, Aisha, and myself. Uh, you will get a decision quickly, immediately after the round. It will be announced here. Uh, without any further ado, now I would like to invite the first speaker of the We RDS to open the debate for side proposition. Thomas, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a beautiful age of the internet, but the freedom it grants is not without its thorns. And when people use it to create shouting matches and promote slacktivism, we see great harms. The greatest source of, this, of, these two, of these harms is in the rise of hashtag movements, and we on Side Proposition stand here today to regret the rise of these. So, to begin, I'd like to talk about what we truly believe, and we would say that we regret the overall majority of hashtags. We already now can see that they have some possible benefits, but we believe that almost all hashtags have significant harms that we will speak about, and uh, we will also talk a bit about differentiation. And uh, we talk about this in two main arguments, the first being that um, hashtags are oversimplified and how this impassions people and how it damages discourse. Uh, the second will be about the team mentality it generates and how this is also very, very uh, harmful to the discourse. And then third, uh, thirdly, my second speaker will talk about how this creates a false sense of action. No, thank you. Um, so we would like to identify a trend in modern society of how there is a, there is a very visible polarisation of the internet and that how this has in recent years led to also a polarisation in wider society, the political spectrum and in, and in daily life between people who uh, used to be very close friends and are perhaps torn apart by, by these kinds of polarisations. And we would like to talk about how we believe hashtag movements have very much influenced these situations. Um, and bef just before I get into our substantive, I'd like to talk about the differentiation that we see in, in the kind of hashtag, hashtags that are used. Uh, ones that are unilateral versus ones that are conflicted. Conflicted ones are ones where there exist people on both sides of these hashtags. They use differing ones and uh, there is, we talk about how there's often little engagement. These are the more important hashtags that we wish to be talking about. They often have far greater numbers of people who support them. This is because when you are standing in front of a screen, when you see uh, views that you often agree with, as in the case of unilateral hashtags, the Me Too is therefore the exceptional example where the benefits are perhaps uh, slightly more significant. But I'm you sorry, often sir. do not feel uh, necess no, thank you. Uh, you often do not feel the need to engage with those because you already agree. However, conflicted hashtags are far more important. It seems they got, gather more attention and their harms are much greater, as we will speak about. So, to get into my first substantive, um, so uh, we see that often these, hash these conflicted hashtags uh, generate ideological bubbles. These bubbles are very, very harmful as they represent the dangers of one opi opinion. When you are looking through the internet uh, and you are a member of one of these bubbles, everyone around you has the same idea. You often see people you agree with, and this means that you are less and less accepting of the existence of other ideas. Right? So this means that, as, uh, that there is a distinct lack of discourse. There is very much uh, studies. There have been very many studies that have been done that have shown that there is a lack. Yes. So how does the idea of me believing that it's inherently bad that women are raped, you know, somehow polarize me from the rest of society? Thank you. So this is where we wanted to do our differentiation between unilateral and conflicted ones. And here I'm talking about the conflicted ones, which we believe are far more important to this debate, considering that far more people are like members of these conflicted points, like whether or not. Um, 
Uh, certain policies should be put into effect, political points that are also very important for democratic governments and democratic discourse, which we will be talking about. My second speaker will be talking more about how the benefits of unilateral uh, hashtags that are that are agreed on by most are, in fact, uh, much less. But I am talking mostly about conflicting. So, uh, to continue, again, there have been very many studies that have been done that have shown that like these uh, uh, areas where you have conflict hashtags to differing sides have actually very, very little engagement. They almost always retweet and talk to each other. Very little is done between the two. This is, explains the reason why you often, if you are a member of any, either of these groups, only see your own side. And this, this then entrenches those beliefs. But then what does happen when you do uh, engage with the other side? It is very, it is very violent. It, well. In the internet sense, it is very painful, then thank you. And, and I will talk about more, more of that in my second argument. So uh, what then, what else is there to say about the oversimplification of how this impassions people? So uh, we also see that these uh, hashtags are often driven by celebrities. Uh, they are not nearly as knowledgeable about all these subjects. However, they still carry the most weight because people see them often in their day-to-day lives. They, they recognize them when they see them on the screen. And people often are... Uh, 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 convinced to accept their views very, very simply. This means that they drown out experts and other logical views very, very often, and this can lead to a lot of incorrect calls. And in general, the impassioned nature of a lot of these hashtag movements can lead to the firing of someone or the, um, the forced retirement of someone by popular demand sure. rather yes. than a fair trial, no thank you, which we think is like uh, a not a very good representation of what should be represented in the justice system. And uh, we think that that is a, a large harm caused by these kinds of hashtag movements. And finally, uh, we would like to talk about, uh, in this argument, political swaying, how um, this applies to both in conflicted and unilateral arguments, how this polarization leads to more extreme political elections. We have seen, like in, in the United States, that, that uh, there is an increase in polarization. We believe that hashtag culture has contributed, at least to some degree, to this. Um, and this is because of the fact that, that uh, Hashtag culture is easy to exploit by groups willing to push like an agenda. It is easy to automate, you can generate lots of bots and have a lot of fake accounts. And this is due to the simple nature of hashtags. They are often, uh, you can often be to some degree anonymous on them. You can, um, you can easily like generate a lot of these accounts. The messages are small and simple. They can be automated. They don't, they are very hard to critically view. And even so, the discourse is so bad that there is often very little critical thinking. These people who are hard to be followed because they cannot accept, no thank you, uh, other views, often do not like choose to critically uh, view these people. And if uh, opposition were to say, no thank you, that uh, there is like a, a uh, that, that a lot of these bots have been found, they, they are often caught after the damage is done. Due to the fact that these bubbles are very, very collective, they only uh, are detected when they get thousands of retweets. And finally, someone from a, a more critically thinking bubble or from a bubble from a different ideological view actually finds this retweet after it has received a huge amount of views. And by this point, the damage is already done. It has already enforced the views of thousands. So this could be incredibly damaging. And it's not... Uh, and the critical thinking is not there to uh, protect them. So, to move into my second argument about the polarised discourse, um, and this is exclusively on in the case of conflicted uh, hashtags. So, uh, we see that this is not discourse, it is simply the pointing fingers. When you do get an engagement between these sides, when it does happen, which it happens very rarely, it is often incredibly unhelpful. It is not real discourse, it doesn't benefit anyone. It's mostly exclusively personal attacks due to the short length of these uh, hashtags the uh, logical argu arguments are hard to present this means that you can't like actually make long explanatory reasoning for, for your point you have to make uh, po uh, poignant emotional claims this leads to incorrect calls and it damages the understanding of each other when you have to um, present things in such a light that is uh, unreasonable and also it, uh, in these areas we view that we see that different views are immediately shut down. People raise opposing views uh, very, uh, uh, for example, when if they wish to widen the scope of a certain ha hashtag, and they almost in immediately shut down. They, have, they can often be pushed off the website and are forced to go private. It, it can often get very, very personal for these people in how they are attacked. And this not, uh, not only damages the discourse within the, is not only a sign of the damaged discourse, but it also leads to the fact that they are even less willing to engage, engage. And not only that, but it also crushes this person. They often have to leave the website entirely and, and uh, do not know what they have to believe. So, we believe that these kinds of hashtag movements can generate diabolical mirror images. They can be extremely harmful to discourse. They do not actually 
present anything, and they provide an easy opportunity for political governments and groups to exploit them. And for these reasons, I'm very proud to propose this motion. Thank you. Okay, the speaking time was 8 minutes 80 seconds, I, uh, 18 seconds. I thank the speaker for his fine speech. And now I invite the first speaker to open the debate for side opposition. Stage is yours, Alexander. On Team Check Red, we find it absolutely reprehensible that Team Sweden in today's debate openly says that women standing for their rights and saying openly that they were raped and that they were victims of sexual abuse and that this should not be true and that this should not continue harms political discourse. We find it absolutely reprehensible that they absolutely neglect the idea of these victims themselves and the, and, and the horrible impacts we have upon them. Several things in my speech. First of all, what is the stance of side of opposition? And second of all, what is the power of these hashtag movements? Third of all, to the point of vilification, normalization, and oversimplification. Then I'll bring my own argument on how we create awareness and why this is fundamentally God on a financial and societal level. First of all, what do we stand on side of opposition? What we have to prove you in today's debate is that we bring a positive impact towards, first of all, the victims, and then we increase societal activism. What on the contrary, Team Sweden today has to prove to you is that exactly these hashtag movements create negative societal repercussions uh, and repercussions towards the victims. Now, first of all, to my question, what is the power of these hashtag movements? First of all, we tell you that they are, uh, that first of all, they are short, catchy phrases, right? We tell you that they often convey the message in a very simple way, right? Just the very idea of me too. What does it exert? It tells you, I too what, wait, 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 was subject to sexual abuse. I too understand what you went through, right? Therefore, by giving this simple idea, we convey the whole entire message. I will talk about how this further translates to the media in my own constructive argument. Second of all, when we have a look uh, the, the, in the clarification of the motion, the, itself. It says it takes part on social media. What role do they really play here? We tell you that practically everyone in our society has social media, right? When we tell you that, for example, on Facebook, when this starts trending, it starts trending from celebrities, as I will tell you my constructive argument, or Twitter, when we have trending hashtags themselves, right? We tell you here that when people see this, they can, they, they, they can open up a whole feed, as I will look into my argument further. Now, let me go on to the vilification where they tell us that you really... Uh, First of all, we, we find it quite ambiguous, you know, how, how does this really happen? They tell us, you know, you believe that rape is bad and therefore you don't see the other side of perspective. We really need a more nuanced mechanism on this. But even if we take them on their highest ground, we give you two fundamental reactions. First of all, let's have a look at the Me Too movement. We tell you most men said sorry for this. They said sorry. When I was 16, I pushed a girl into having sex with me. I am truly sorry. I understand your perspective now. I will tell you why I understand this in my own own constructive argument. Now, second of all, how does prevention lead here? We tell you by having these hashtags, we demonize the we, we demonize the people who condone the actions, just like they rape someone, right? We see that if they do it, then they will be put up to social media. People will find out they will do it, and therefore, because they don't want to generally be seen as bad people, they won't do it. Why is this especially true for social media? Well, because we put ourselves out on social media. Our friends are capable of seeing so, right? Therefore, we see no incentive for these people whatsoever. Second of all, to the idea of normalization to tell us, you know, it gets into our society, it's going to become normal. We give you several reactions. First of all, we tell you this is often adopted, or these whole movements are often subsidized or adopted by NGOs or companies. What does this essentially mean? This, this means, first of all, it has a huge financial support basis. Why is this important? Well, because it can keep the movement going, right? It can help, it gives support for the victims to come out. We tell you that in, oftentimes the victims don't come out because they don't feel confident on the platform they're going to be coming out. And exactly because companies have this, they can always bring a new perspective and keep going on and on and on, right? Now, 
Let me move on quickly to the uh, let me move on quickly to the idea of hate speech they brought up. We give you several reactions. First of all, uh, let me compare uh, the hate speech to words. What this really means for the victim. When we tell you when we have the hashtag like Me Too or Black Lives Matter, we say this is especially important. Oh, thank you, man. Especially important for the people who are abused here. We tell you that they have a sense a sense of support from the others, right? We tell you that in cases like with ALS, like the Ice Packet Challenge fought for, it is incredibly important, this psychological mentality behind this, right? They need support of society because it is not only a huge physical endeavor, but they need to know that something's waiting on the other side for them. We tell you when they have support of everyone, they see that people are standing there for them, right? And therefore have motivation to prevail and keep going on, as Elena will tell you in her own constructive argument. Furthermore, now, to the idea of hate speech, again, they tell you, you know, people will be forced to leave the websites. We tell you this is not bad. These are people who deserve to be off the internet. But more so, we tell you that even if we see the people who are actually going uh, in a moment, or we see the people who are going against them, right? We can point them out. We can already see that these people are going against those women. And more so, we, uh, or let me take a point now. Yes. So a lot of hashtag movements can be like run by uh, people that we might not agree with, or a lot of people might not agree with, or in conflicted scenarios like like alt right groups. And these people can push people off the internet, even respectable people who try to use logic to be pushed off by the personal attacks that they use. Right. Okay, but we can still point these people. I, I, you know, you're talking about. I, I don't really get your point about the whole idea of experts, right? You're saying I, I will react to your point on experts in my own constructive argument, and tell you how they give an un unobjective view, which fundamentally harms the movements. But I don't really get this point. We really need more clarification on this. Now, let me move on quickly to what it means for the victims. Uh, as I said, for the victims themselves, right? They have support. They want to prevail, etc., etc. More from Elena. Now, let me quickly move on to my own constructive argument on the idea of awareness. Five layers of analysis. First of all, why are people not aware of these pertinent issues now? We give you several reasons. First of all, they're usually written about in articles. Articles tend to be long, complex, and therefore people don't really have an incentive to read about them. They don't have time, or they don't understand. Second of all, we often tell you, we tell you that often the people who write these articles have no emotional association with, 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 this, with this movement whatsoever. They did not go for the movement. They are not suppressed or repressed in any which way. Therefore, they give you a plain objective view, giving no emotional association. Finally, we tell you that the victims who read this have no association. They don't believe they are properly represented and therefore don't come up in a certain way uh, elsewhere because the message is not conveyed. Secondly, layer analysis. Why are these factors so important and why will this lead to spreading? First of all, we tell you that they're short, these messages are short, punchy, and are a hit blow to the issue. We tell you they usually convey the message as with me too. It expresses sexual abuse. They say, I stand with you, I understand what you went through, right? And no, 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 thank you. This is especially important because people want short answers to very important questions, right? And therefore, through this hashtag, they get that answer. Second of all, it is emotionally heavy, therefore, it has some sort of association, right? They, these hashtag moments give the voice to the voice because these people now have a platform through which they can tell their story, right? A short one. One in which they do not have to, you know, they don't really have to put their, or exploit themselves in a certain way. Just by saying, me too, they associate with a whole entire movie as we'll talk about later. Third layer, we tell you why Why do these hashtags translate into media? Two ideas. First of all, people latch on. As we said, a social media, it essentially compels people to take part in this because of some sort of societal pressure as it rises. We tell you the example of the ALS Ice Packet Challenge, where friends challenge friends and family challenge family to, 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 you know, to, to go through the process and then donate to the ALS Foundation, right? Second of all, we tell you media. Um, we tell you that they want to spread awareness. The victims themselves go into these media organizations. Second of all, media want to generate profit, and therefore if it's a prominent issue, they will write more and more about it, right? Okay. Fourth layer, why do people care about these movements? We tell you that people before didn't know about them because we had a limited amount of information. We tell you that now that they find out, they feel morally culpable for what is happening in their society right now. Because they know, I could have prevented this in some stage of my life, or I can prevent it now. They understand the pertinence of the issue, and now they can move. What does this mean to lead to? Two things. First of all, social activism, where we tell you, because of this moral culpability, people will want to go in, on and on. The example is Coney, where we had a trending, we had a trending hashtag, then people going out into protests and compelling the FBI to go back to Coney. More from Elena. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, the speaker, for his fine speech. Uh, the speaking time was 8 minutes 18 seconds. Uh, now I'd like to invite the second speaker from the side of the proposition to continue the debate. Thank you very much.
So this point about like awareness. Now we think it's really good to raise awareness, but not this way in which we believe is inflammatory. We say that there's an alternative. We saw loads of activism between the 60s and the 90s, right? We think throughout history people have been politically engaged and like being passionate about topics. What we see on uh, with like the rise of hashtag movements is instead people are willing to just like express their opinion and leave it at that, without actually engaging, without actually going uh, like speaking in politics, without actually do making actions that actually improve the situation. And they say that people latch on, well, we think people do this anyway. I'm going to talk more about that anyway, right? Before that. The last thing about conveying the full message, we really want to ask opposition, how on earth does Me Too or Black Lives Matter they convey the whole message of sexual harassment or like, uh, no thank you, or police, uh, pre police brutality against black, um, black people in the United States. We think those are much bigger topics that, that cannot be constrained to one hashtag, they have to explain that. No thank you. So how this how this creates a false sense of health, right? And we're going to show that they don't actually, uh, like, by using these hashtags, we don't actually help or actively harm the movements, right? So four points under this. First of all, we think, and the opposition agrees with this, we think that these messages are simplified. You have a limited amount of characters, you have short messages, and if you write something longer, we think it's oftentimes not read anyway, so this huge incentive to be short and snappy. But we think these are immensely complex issues, right? We don't get what opposition says when they say it's the whole issue. Like, men who, uh, who, like, men without experience of sexual harassment are not going to understand the full, like, impact of sexual harassment on a woman if they've never had those experiences and have not been able to, like, talk to a woman. We don't think, like, the Me Too campaign alone conveys the, like, full harms that that causes to a victim, right? Imagine. We say that people don't actually know about full harms. You saw this with the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Um, um, Black Lives Matter, right? People don't understand what that's actually about. And that's why you have this reactionary movement of All Lives Matter, because they don't get the complexities of uh, race in America, right? We say like these short and snappy messages are inherently bad. Yes, please. We showed you how men said sorry to women only by because understanding through the Me Too hashtags how this can be harmful. Men who abuse women in the past explain why this is bad. Right. Okay, so like we said, there's a lot of men out there who are really aware, and they're usually aware through other mediums that are like beyond these hashtag movements. They probably have friends who talk to them about it, they've probably read articles about it. I think this is true in any circumstance I can think of, right? People who just view the Me Too thing and have, don't have those experiences of actually talking to women in a nuanced way, or talking to people who have experienced sexual harassment, probably don't have those experiences, probably just think the Me Too movement is like superficial and annoying, right? So. Secondly, how this encourages slacktivism. And like they bring up this example of Coney. Well, this is a perfect example for our side because nothing happened with Coney. Like uh, it, it turned out to be, no, no thank you, right? So like this didn't actually like, help solve the situation at all. We say that people tweet and they believe that they help, but like, um, believe that they help without having actually like done anything, right? We say that they feel like they don't need to self-improve anymore because they think they're so active politically already by retweeting. We think the comparative is that if you're feeling like you don't help, you're more likely to actually become involved in an issue and do something more meaningful or more nuanced to help it, right? Uh, so like we think this is much more meaningful. We talked about like animal rights during the 90s. We think people are actually involved like, you know, going into slaughterhouses and rescuing strays and they are just like, tw uh, like retweeting pictures of cows. Like how this, we also think like this takes away from justice, right? Because the huge amount of backlash that it's caused means that like people are often demonized. It means that um, it means that like when someone's accused of something on the internet, we have people like visiting their households, targeting their families, and for these reasons, I'm very proud to propose. I thank the speaker for her fine speech. The speaking time was 8 minutes 19 seconds. I would like to remind the debaters to keep the order in the room while the others are speaking. And without any further ado, I'd like to invite the second speaker for the opposition to continue the debate. And secondly, I will talk about the pluralized discourse, which wasn't really explained, the mechanism wasn't really there. And then I will talk about the awareness and about my own constructive but about, about victims. So let's move firstly to the, to the first argument about how the hashtag is oversimplified and why it should somehow bring harm. The side of proposition failed to show us the mechanism 
why this oversimplified message uh, brings us to some kind of harness, brings us to something what we should regret. What we are saying is that it is absolutely okay to have this simply message because it's not only that you post this and uh, nobody really take care about this, nobody really uh, understand it and nobody really write about this anything. What does it mean when you post this hashtag? You can write to this hashtag something, your story, okay. so no thank you. So people can listen to you and understand you. Secondly, there is the media attention. So the media will talk about your case, will talk about your problem, let's say of sexual abuse. So the society will become aware of it and there is the impact, there is the unique benefits we are bringing to you. And thirdly, there will be the inspiration for others, there will be the speeches made by not only the victims, but also the activists which could, should not, could not be the victims but take care of this problem and want to solve it. And that's really, really important. That's the unique benefit we are bringing to you. So that does not mean that this oversimplified message brings hearts. The only thing they told you is that there is some kind of ideological bubble but they never really explained to you the mechanism why this some kind of bubble really arise and why this should be some unique harm but we've explained you what become after the hashtag is post what become not uh, through the posting but after this why the society cares why the individual cares and why there is the change in behavior for example in the man who did the rape so now let's move to the second argument about the pluralized discourse. What they told us here is that it is inherently bad when there is some kind of pluralization. But what we see nowadays is that when the hashtag is posted, the people talk about it. And the people not do not talk about it like I'm in the one group and I'm in another and we do we will not speak with each other. No, there is the discussion, there is the discussion in the media, and the media really compare it. The, the media understand that there is the problem and usually when you take a look for example at the Me Too campaign I think that here you can see that the society really stands behind the victims and there is no this division in the discourse. No thank you. And now let's move to our two constructives about the awareness and about the victims. Because the side of a proposition failed to react on our uh, argument about the awareness. Because we clearly explained to you in Alex's speech that there is clear difference between posting a hashtag and really uh, making start in the discussion and just posting the article. Because nowadays, what the side of the proposition has to show us that uh, they have something to regret when they are saying that the solidarity can be reached by other forms. They are not showing us the reason why we should regret the solidarity reached after posting the hashtag. So here you can see that if the solidarity is here, another benefit. And the awareness here is because firstly, you do not talk about it just in the articles and there is the media attention. Because when you post a hashtag in your article, in your story, it means that people can find it and people want to find out about it because whole society cares about it. Because whole society wants to solve it, wants to find a solution. No, thank you. And uh, uh, thirdly, uh, you, ha you have here the victims, which I will analyze in my own constructive. Then uh, we were talking about the media, where Alex told you about the Xbucket challenge and about the impact of the hashtag. The impact of the hashtag was the donation afterwards, was the action. So here you can see that the hashtag can have really, really beneficial impact and that is something what we're promoting and what we really want to have here and that's the reason why we do not regret the rise of the hashtag movement. We were talking about the hashtag Connie 2012 where side of proposition told us that there was no impact, that nothing really happened. But ladies and gentlemen, there was the impact because MPI taken action because of because of the starting of the discussion. There was a film a posting after the rise of this hashtag movement and so the FBI finally sold the solution and really uh, abandoned the, ch the children army which uh, which stand behind no thank you which was the problem of the hashtag movement proposed and secondly we were to, so basically the impact of the awareness there are two impacts first is the social activism where you could see this impact
fact, for example, in the Ice Bucket Challenge, what does it mean? It means that when you, when you want to pay attention, when you want to explain a problem, what you do is that you write the hashtag, but also you can donate because you can see that everybody does it and you really want to be included in this because the society feels quite immoral when they do not do anything about the problem. And secondly, the, that's connected to this is the financial part where you actually go and do some kind of solution because you donate it, because you help the people which need this help. And now let's move to the victims because victims are the individuals which have like which receives the biggest benefits here. Firstly, how Alex already explained you, the, here is the demonizing of the problem because of the media, because of raising the awareness, because of spreading the message. So there is the power of hashtag already explained. And now let's move to the impact. Firstly, to the victims, they will receive bigger moral support. Why, why is moral support really important? It has the psychological impact on you because your mental health got improved. When, for example, this women who got raped in the Me Too, uh, in the Me Too, Me Too movement, you can see that they're getting out from depression because they can see that there is the moral support. Why the moral support is here? Firstly, because they see that they're not alone here. Because they see that there is the victim's cohesion, that there are other victims who go through the same thing as they went and that's why these people got confidence and feel that they are morally supported. Secondly, you've got a society, the society that stands behind you, the society that does not stand behind the criminals.